This is the I Love Success Podcast. I'm Peter Jurukowski, and I have made a vow to myself to help as many people as possible to achieve their dreams. Let's get started. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the I Love Success Podcast. What I'm trying to do is to help you guys achieve your dreams. And how do we achieve dreams? We make them goals. We find something we need to do every day to get a little bit closer. To help you guys out, I meet and talk to some of the experts all over the world in different areas. So you can get a little bit more uh, inspired, but also get the tools to transform your life. And I'm really excited for this week's episode. I've been trying to get it this guest on for a very long time. And the first time I read about this guy, I was blown away and here we are and we're going to chat for about 50 minutes. So without further ado, uh, this week we have Hunil Strauss. uh, uh, This week we have Hunil Strauss, author of the game called The Undisputed Father of Modern Seduction. His name is Ross Jeffries, and he is so much more than that. He's an author, speaker, trainer, master hypnotist, and master practitioner of NLP. Ross has coached and mentored thousands of men around the world for the past 30 years, guiding them to success with women and business through the power of subconscious communication. So let's talk sales, seduction, and success with Ross Jeffries. So Ross, welcome to the I Love Success podcast. Thank you. I should say my actual name is Paul Ross, and here's my book, Subtle Words to Tell. Here's a book I wrote in 1988 under the pseudonym Ross Jeffries, How to Get the Women You Desire into Bed, a down and dirty guide to dating and seduction for the man (laughs) who's fed up with being Mr. Nice Guy. So you can see I've slightly changed in appearance over the years. Is that you on that Uh, picture? That's me. Oh, wow. uh, This is me today. Yay. Yeah, we've rebranded substantially. I I get that, and you know, just kind of give you my backstory and how I know who you are. So, I think it was ten, fifteen years ago. A friend of mine gave me the book, The Game, uh, like many others, uh, and uh, started reading that book. Started getting interested in you know, getting laid, being more attractive in the eyes of women. Uh, But for me, after reading the game, I also realized there was a lot of people in this seduction community that were actually not happy. And it was not a good way of life for me. So instead, I started focusing on self-development, getting better in my mind, which helped me a lot in my career as an athlete and in karate. And I managed to become a world medalist. And I would attribute a lot of that to the mindset strategies that I've read about from all of the authors from the game basically, and even others. So that's how I got introduced to you the first time. Uh, So can you just talk about when when did you get interested in seduction and how how did that journey start for you? I can give you the history and that's a typical kind of question. I'll give you the history, but that's biography. The more, to me, the more fun question that I, I like to answer was what was my driving force and what keeps me interested in this today and yes i wanted to get laid i was a 25 year old virgin very very ugly had no social skills that's true but i always thought in the back of my mind since i was like five or six years old that i was meant to walk a path didn't know what it was i even had a vision as a very young boy my father worked for a orthopedic surgeon and the orthopedic surgeon had a huge estate in Bel Air. Now, you know where Bel Air is and it overlooked like a canyon. I remember looking out in the canyon and having a kind of blurry vision of teaching a huge arena, not an arena, but a huge group of men. So even then, I buried it and I forgot about it. I didn't bury it, I just forgot about it. And then subsequently, many years later, I was like at UCLA, maybe in my very early 20s and the 10th woman in a row had canceled on me with some stupid excuse like my parakeet is sick I need to take them to that I don't remember that wasn't it but it was stupid shit like that I remember yelling out loud when am I going to solve this and the little voice of intuition in my head said when you solve it for yourself you'll solve it for everyone and so I always believed 
that I was meant to do something great. I didn't know what it was. I just didn't. And then I stumbled onto NLP. I thought, you know, this is fascinating. This study of how language can affect people on the unconscious or subconscious level, I like to use them inter interchangeably. This study fascinates me. I'm gonna make this my life's work. And I remember having the vision of being in a hurricane and being blown off my feet, but my wrapping my arms around a palm tree and that palm tree represented NLP. I remember thinking, I'm not letting go of you. I'm going to master you. And so it became my life's work. And for me, the real question is what keeps you passionate about doing it? That's the question. I've been doing it now 32 years. Why have I not? No, no granted you, I've rebranded. I've mapped over everything I know about seduction and dating and the selling because I think selling is the, uh, dating is the ultimate sale. You've got to do, you've got to get your confidence up. You've got to do your prospect outreach. You've got to do your qualifying questions, do your sales presentation, go for the close, overcome objections. That's a big sale. So I managed to map it over. I hope this answers your questions to some extent. Yeah. Peter, right? Yeah, that's correct. And it does answer my questions. And I'm, very, very curious how, uh, you know, you, you started mastering NLP, but did that also improve your confidence or how, how did you work on your There's confidence? no such thing. There's no such thing as confidence. Okay. Confidence is not a thing like this spray bottle that gets rid of cat odor or this pair of reading glasses. It's not a thing. It's a practice that you do and a process that arises in your neurology from moment to moment. And it's contextually based. You're really good at karate. So you have what I call performance confidence. You've done well in a thousand tournaments. That means 1001, you have a reasonable, reliable, intelligently informed enthusiasm that you'll do well. The trap that people get into is they want performance confidence or competence before they've done much performing. So we need to redefine what confidence is. And it's not a thing. It is something, it is a process, a wave that arises in your neurology. It expands, it contracts, it gets bigger and smaller according to the context, your breathing, your beliefs, and your beliefs are not the same. Everyone says just hold positive beliefs. Well, that depends on where your level of competency is. I don't want to hold the positive belief that I know I can fly that Airbus 380. I know I can fly it. I know I can fly it. I don't want that. We have to balance this confidence with common sense and critical thinking. What's so left out of the area of self-improvement is critical thinking, and making good decisions and a good learning strategy. That to me is more important than this mythical thing called confidence. You're referring to performance confidence. I don't think, and so I would rather have what I call learning confidence, which says I may not do it right the first 10 times, 100 times, but I have a really good system for learning from my mistakes. And to me, this is the one element that every aspect of self improvement, all the books from that bullshit artist Napoleon Hill, to Rufus T. Glitter Teeth, Tony Robbins are leaving out. Everyone says, Peter, have you ever heard this saying, just learn from your mistakes? Yeah. Does anyone show you how? Do they give you a process of how? Very few. So that's one of the things that I've developed that makes me unique, not just as a coach for men, which I do very rarely anymore. Unless you have a ton of bucks, if you want to throw high five figures my way, I'll coach you and I'll get you where you want to go. I'll tell you how to contact me after this. But unless you have that way of learning from your mistakes, you're going to constantly be falling back into them. And then you have that internal struggle, the new way of thinking, the new behaviors you're trying to program in, and then obsessing on your mistakes over and over and over and over again. And here's the universal law of the mind, two of them. The mind can't tell the difference between what you obsess upon, what you review, and what you're programming it back in to do. So if you dwell on a mistake a hundred times, the brain says, oh, they're programming in a hundred times to make that mistake. And when you go back into life in that same context, the brain's going to choose what has the most repetition, familiarity, momentum. And which one does, the positive thinking or the old stuff you've dwelt on a thousand times? And so this is what makes change so exhausting. If, as you're listening to this, you've ever experienced that change feels exhausting, this is the how 
not the why. I don't give a flying bubbly squirrel fart is the why. I look at process. What is, this is NLP. NLP doesn't ask why. NLP looks at process. I want to know what is the deep underlying structure beneath the surface that keeps people stuck, that causes internal conflict. And it's not because you are a thing called a self-sabotager or you lack some mysterious fluid called self-esteem. I have low self-esteem. Well, I have low oil in my car. I'm going to go have someone put in four quarts. It's not about that. It's about having a crappy learning strategy. Does that I mean, make sense or am I just ranting? No, it does make sense. But, uh, and I mean, it, it sounds so, so easy because you're a master at this. So, so, so take, let's take it back to someone listening at this right now that are, you know, they want to have a good life. They want to create a great business. They want to be attractive in, and know how to talk to women and, and just create that successful life for themselves. Where do they start? I think they have to start with an understanding of, the basic idea that there's no such thing as attraction. There's no such thing as success. There's no such thing as confidence. These are not things. I'm playing linguistics, but linguistics is powerful. They're not things. They're processes and practices. If we think of confidence as a quantity of something like porridge that's doled out in an orphanage, and you have to put your plate out to life and say, please, sir, I want some more. Then we're fucked. Can I say fucked? We're, yeah. we're, we're fucked from the very I beginning. I hope so. We'll see if Facebook bans us. <laughs> okay. We're fucked from the very beginning. So again, looking at the power of language to either free our world or freeze it to create stumbling blocks or to create stepping stones. Knowing the power of language and its transformational power to keep us stuck or move us ahead is extremely powerful. That's first and foremost. And I recommend my book, so where does it yeah. sell? But also get a mentor. Someone once told me, I have several mentors and coaches, and one of them said, hey, a mentor is someone who's paid your idiot tax. I've made all the mistakes that you've yet to make. I can take your feet and help you avoid stepping on the landmines and yeah. set them on the path. Yeah, so get someone that can help you with this process. And if you, let's say you're in a town there where you don't have those people, like, are you doing this by watching video clips like this? Or like, how do you, how do you get started? Because what I see a lot, I meet a lot of people with a lot of potential and I, I've seen this as a coach in karate, for example, but there are things that are stopping them from doing the work. A lot of what's stopping them, I think, are spiritual poisons because I'm also a meditator. I think the big thing is our, the big spiritual poisons are resentment, envy, despair, and impatience, demandingness. People don't understand that these things are operating all the time in the very subtle background of consciousness. These are the big ones I think that get in the way and the inability to tolerate frustration and confusion. We now live in the most spoiled attention deficit, narcissistic personality disorder. I think the whole society is orbiting about the dark star of narcissism and attention deficit. And you even look at things like, I'm so sick to death of the secret. And why is it that all these courses on manifesting your dreams Never talk about ridding the world of hunger, bringing clean drinking water to 2 billion children who don't have it. It's always about the guru showing his five Rolls Royces, his 10 homes in exotic locations. Hey, you selfish, narcissistic, dumb prick. How about improving the world a little bit? So I think people can start with a meditation practice. I have my teacher taught me anything I know about meditation. I learned from my teacher, Shinzen Young. Y-O-U-N-G, S-H-I-N-Z-E-N, Y-O-U-N-G. I learned from my master, my teacher. I've had the good fortune of having incredible teachers, Peter. I mean, people who you think, I've got to keep learning from this person. Shinzen is the greatest mind I've ever encountered, the greatest teacher. He's got a audio series called The Science of Enlightenment that I recommend everyone get sort of undercutting my own promoting myself but hey you know <laughs> you, i'm answering your question yeah uh, i want to talk about love is love a thing or is not a thing well what do you think after you've heard me express myself what do you think i mean 
I do believe in love. That's not your question. That wasn't your question. I believe well, the question is, is love a thing? Is that something that you can experience? That's not what you, well, those are two different things. Is love a thing like a chocolate bar? Love is, or is love a process that you do on the conscious and unconscious levels? Is it a practice like the Buddhists say? Define your terms, sir. So Voltaire, let me... the famous Voltaire, the famous French philosopher and playwright, and unfortunately anti Semite, said, If you're going to debate with me or even discuss with me, I'll modify it. Define your terms. So define your terms, sir. I love it. Yeah. And, and, I'm very happy to have this conversation with a uh, real word Smith like you are. So my terms is, 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 do you believe in love? What does that mean? Is that like, do I believe in Jesus? Do I believe in UFOs? What the fuck does that mean? Are you saying, have I experienced the, have I had the subjective internal experience that people label as love? What are you asking me? Yes, basically what I'm asking you, do, do you believe that you can find one person uh, to love and to live with and be Why happy? Why one? Where did we get the idea that it has to be one? How did that matrix get pulled over our eyes? Yeah. Is, it not, is, it, is it a real law of physics and biology that we're only wired to mate with one person for the rest of our lives? I think a lot of studies suggest that we're meant to be monogamous for about seven years, seven or eight years for the time the child can actually walk and move around and somewhat keep up with the herd. Our closest genetic relatives are not monogamous, but I don't know. It depends on culture. Yeah. What kind of culture are you in? All You cannot separate these behaviors and experiences from the culture. What disturbs me is the culture that constantly bombards us that loving someone is the most important experience in your whole life. And the, so I was watching, flipping the channels, and I saw Mamma Mia, the movie. And it was a <laughs> song by ABBA. We both love Sweden. Yeah. Don't go wasting your emotion. Save all your love for me. Uh, as if it was a limited quality or quantity, and you can only do it with one person. Those messages are bombarded over and over and over through media, TV, movies, popular music. I used to have a Swedish girlfriend. I was 49, she was 19. Loved her, love of my life, so to speak, if we can use the terms, the sloppy terms. But she used to <laughs> play songs by Neo, like, I used to be commander in chief of my pimp ship. I said, don't play that beggar shit in my house. You put on headphones, you don't play that. <laughs> a, um, a baby, baby, I'm slaughtered by your love. Bullshit. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, so if, if we, let's move away from love then and talk about like what is important for happiness in life? Because what I'm, what I'm trying to do here is redefining something. What am I, the freaking Buddha? I'm a Jewish guy who writes books on getting <laughs> laid, uh, books on using hypnotic language to sell like hell. Yes, but you have met thousands of men. You have met huh? thousands of men that have been in a position that they don't want to be in life and you have studied and helped those people. So I want to debunk all that knowledge that you have put in and share that with the world. Well, even then, I've had students who are just looking for one woman. I had a student, I forget his name, but he was an Orthodox Catholic and a virgin. He wanted to remain a virgin until his wedding night, but he wanted to date enough woman, women so he could pick the right one. Then I have students who go through women like tissue paper. So what makes them happy? I don't know. The tools are morally neutral. Are you, I can tell you what makes me happy. Yeah. Teaching Let's and speaking and opening up people's minds and seeing that moment, being able to look at an audience and see that moment when the light bulb goes on and people's whole paradigm of how they think switches and they can never go back to the old way of thinking. Now, you've experienced this. As you listen to me in the audience, you've experienced this. You've had the experience of not being able to tell time, of trying hard to read that clock, maybe it was second, third grade. I don't remember when it was for you. And you struggled. What do you mean the big hands on the 12 and the little's on the six? What does that even mean? And one day I woke up 
and you could read that clock on the wall. I remember it was a cuckoo clock and you could never go back to not being able to tell time again. Your whole way of thinking shifted. There was a time when you were a very young child, when you realized that mommy and daddy had their own names and their own identities, whatever those might be. And you can never go back to ever quite seeing them the same way. So there's a time when you realize, wait, wait, the world beneath my feet is actually moving. It blew your mind, but you can never go back to seeing it or experiencing it the same way. Just so I lived for those moments as a transformational teacher to see those moments of understanding of people and light them up. I live for impact. When I die, I want to fall on my deathbed. I want a smoking hot nine year old Swedish girl making me happy and an audience of people gathered around me that I can teach. <laughs> I love that. And what you're talking about impact. So what's the most important impact you want to have in people's lives? I want people to see past the matrix of how language freezes their world and their life and open up their neural pathways that they can to achieve what they want to achieve through using the power of language. I'll unpack that and give you some specific examples if you'd like. Yeah, I would like to, uh, I, I would like to go there. I also want to talk about, you know, the power of language. Uh, can you just also answer this question? Because I'm curious, in the beginning when you learn language and patterns and how to speak, it's almost like a script, right? Is that correct? In a sense, yes. Uh, and when do you go from the script to become a natural speaker again and just having well, that like as we a know in nlp as we know in N the nlp model is there's unconscious incompetence you're incompetent and you're not even aware of it <clears throat> excuse me there's conscious incompetence where you're incompetent and you recognize it there's conscious competence where you're consciously aware of what you're doing and it's working then there's unconscious competence where it becomes second nature so you have to move through that learning curve, that period of where it doesn't necessarily feel natural at first. And that's fine. That's how we learn. It didn't feel natural when you learned to walk. I'm assuming, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I know as a fighter, the first time I went to a competition, I was thinking about everything and doing the techniques in a specific way as I've trained, but the better I became, it be, I became one with the movement and reacted very fluently and it was, it felt amazing. So I guess it's, it might be the same thing. Sounds about so. Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah. Please give us a couple of examples. Um, yeah. So I remember when I used to teach seminars for guys and invariably the question I get is I can get the sevens and eights. I can't get the nines and tens. And I would laugh and say, there's no such thing as a nine or a 10. There's only the level of sexual excitement you feel in your body. So if your sexual excitement is at a level 10, of course you're not gonna be able to think straight. If your brain is exploding with jizz, how can you think straight enough to have a conversation to calibrate emotionally, to calibrate socially? You're not gonna be able to. So by thingifying your world with language, you lose contact with the process that's going on inwardly what you can make contact with you can modify what you can't see is going to be in control of you automatically same when i teach sales people say to me i don't want to do cold calls i say never do a cold call again extend an opportunity do opportunity outreach so reframing things with language unfreezes your world that's what i'm talking about yeah and what else, what else can people do if we go over and talk a little bit more about the sale and your, your, your new book? What, what else is there? That's so unspecific and so general. It's asking for a narrative. Can you be a little bit more specific? Yeah, of course. I mean, you told me that you're helping people adding six figures to their sales that are already It'll, successful. Yeah, they have to be doing a minimum of multiple six figures to work with me. Yeah. It's just... Um, how it is because I'm busy and I, I, I take stars, I turn them into superstars. Well, I teach basic principles. Principle number one, you're never selling a product or service. You're always selling decisions and good feelings about decisions. You can even define yourself as a decision service technician. Here's the thing. Nowadays, people don't know how to make good decisions because they're so distracted. They're so checked out. They're so turned off because we have Twitter, 
we have Facebook Instant Messenger, we have this thing, which could well be the death knell of intelligent society. I'm holding up the cell phone for those of you who are not, for some reason, not watching the video. We have Instant, we have Instagram, we have Tinder, not that I know anything about Tinder. <laughs> um, and so people are horribly distracted. So that being the case, if you're gonna sell them a decision, you need to sell them on the fact that they can even trust making the decision. You need to get them focused in on you. So first principle, you're never selling your product or service. You're always selling decisions and good feelings about decisions. Second principle, before you think of giving people the facts, data, figures, think what state of consciousness do I want them to be in to receive my words? Let me unpack that. Let's use a metaphor. I have a sheet of gold foil and a sheet of cardboard. It's not a trick question, Peter. I want to conduct electricity down one of those mediums. Which one of those is going to conduct the electricity? It's not a trick question. The gold foil or the cardboard? Gold. Exactly. So think of the state of mind of your prospect as being the conductive medium. Do you want them in the cardboard of skepticism, distraction, inability to focus, or do you want them in the gold foil state of being focused, eager to hear you, even on the unconscious level, seeing you as a leader that they have to follow? And my crazy claim is you can use language to create those states of consciousness. So selling being about designing and states of consciousness, both for yourself. What state of mind do you want to be in that serves you best when you go to make the sale? And by the way, it's not being positive. What states of mind do you want to create for your prospect and keep them in and chain them along as you progress along in the sale? These are the more thinking, look, for me, selling is not about getting your ideas into your prospect's mind. It's about expanding their mind to include your ideas. It's a crazy way of thinking, but it's the very ways of thinking and feeling and acting and responding that stand so far outside of what you're used to doing to hold the potential for results that are so far outside of what you're used to enjoying. Think of the metaphor of Columbus. What did people tell Columbus would happen if he kept sailing? You'll fall, you'll fall out of the world, right? You'll fall off the edge of the world, but he didn't. He sailed off their map and discovered a new country. And in so doing, he earned the right to write his own map and to rewrite the maps for the rest of the world. Now his maps were incomplete, as all maps are. My map is incomplete. The difference is I acknowledge it. I welcome students to come on and add in things that I can't see to correct mistakes that I'm so, they're so glued to my face, I can't even see them. Awesome. And uh, I'm curious, like, when did you decide, like, when, when was that pivotal moment in your own life where you decided to, you know, rebrand from seduction to sales? And was that a big decision for you? Very big decision. It happened about, started to happen around 2006. I, I got some emails from students and I get emails all the time saying, thank you. I got a bomb girlfriend or I got married or whatever it is, but I started to get emails saying, I've been using your stuff for selling. I'm making a killing. But hmm, this is interesting. Let me go into my laboratory, see how I can map it over. And I did multiple versions of courses and it wasn't until like two years ago, uh, I wrote, I was able to put it all together, write a book. And then about a year ago, create a course, my subtle words that sell course that lays this all out, my entire incomplete system. Were you tired of, you know, the teaching seduction or what was the moment? There were parts I loved. I loved going to other countries and being welcomed like a rock star and yeah. all the foreign women flocking to me. I'm the, I was the exotic foreigner with yeah. a funny accent. And I loved doing the healing work with guys. But the problem is once you hear, uh, how do I talk to a girl in the beginning? Once you hear it a hundred times, the 10,000th time, where is it your soul? And then I thought, at 60 years old, there's not a lot of dignity in teaching seduction. But you know what? I miss it. I may go back to doing it again. I do have one. I've worked with one before. I do have a current multiple five-figure client who's paying me to train him privately for uh, a year. But this guy's already had girlfriends before. He knows his ass from his elbow. I'm not going to teach 25-year-old virgins who are broke. 
if you're already doing well and you're willing to accept that I'm the highest paid coach you'll ever be happy you hired, then we can talk. I'll give out my email at the end of this. That also pertains to if you're a multiple six-figure sales professional salesperson or entrepreneur and you want to talk to me, you can apply to talk to me. And what, what has been, if we talk about the whole, you know, seduction community, what has been, you know, what's the pros and cons of that community, you think? I think there are a bunch. Of, I, look, Peter, I don't even look at what other people are doing anymore. Yeah. I stay in my lane. I keep my head down. I work on my own innovations. I don't care what other people do. I will say, as far as I can tell, everyone's either copying me or a mystery or a combination of the two of us. And that's it. We're the only two originals. Yeah. And his stuff doesn't work very well. Mine works. And I love what you said. I'm not even focusing what other people are doing. I don't either. care. I used to do it. used to get on to fights, but... One of my coaches said, Paul, what are you doing? Stay in your own lane. Focus on your genius. Move ahead that way. He's right. And the people that are getting into these, you know, societies and learning more and more and doing this more, what, what happens to, to those people? Like, uh, and what do you think about that? Again, I, I don't really pay attention. What disturbs me, though, is there are certain businesses that I won't name that have the business model that makes them a lot of money, but it's not a very good way to teach and transform people. Essentially their model, and I won't name them because I don't want to get sued. I don't want to give them attention and promotion. Their model is they hold the boot camp. Someone comes to the boot camp, graduates, then they charge them a big chunk of money to become one of their official trainers and send them out these clueless people to train other people and make money. So they're holding seminars all over the world in every major city every weekend. They're raking in the money, but they're not helping people because as Jesus said, if the blind lead the blind, won't they all fall into the ditch? Yeah. You're right. So it's all about transformation at the end of the day. Transformation. Yes. As a hypnotist, I'm very interested that as you listen to me, Pay attention to the sound of my voice and notice the changing focus of your eyes and your blink rate. Then you can experience a transformation for yourself. Now, it's not necessary as that's taking place. Never mind, I don't want to play with you. You have to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you trying to hypnotize me? <laughs> I don't try to do anything. I love that. So, if you're not trying to do anything, what do you want to say to people that are trying then? I don't care what other people do. I, I, this is my way of arrogantly saying I know what I do works because I'm good at doing it. Yeah. How, how long did it take you to become a master? About seven. And? No, I, my real, that was being sarcastic. My answer is, I've been doing this 30, 32 years. So I think it took about 10 years, but I never consider mastery is ever fully attained. I'm always learning. Yeah. I never want to stop learning. Like I said, a Swedish 19 year old, beautiful, hot female, Swedish 19 year old, I should say, and learning and teaching on my deathbed. <laughs> and who, who are your biggest teachers in life? That has Shenzhen, Shenzhen Young. Richard Bandler, my mother, who was a great teacher, she taught me in metaphor and myth and story and encouraged me to think on my own. I come from, <clears throat> excuse me, a big Jewish family. And we didn't have a lot of money, but we always had books and we were encouraged to think for ourselves. We were taught that we were smart, actually arrogantly taught that we were the smartest people in the world. And that we were never punished for taking a thought to its logical extreme. I could take any thought. I could say at the dinner table, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. And rather than smacking me, my mother would say, okay, what do Christians believe? And I would say, I don't know. My mom would say, I want a book report by this time tomorrow on what Christians believe. If it's a good book report, I'll give you a silver dollar. Back then, we had coins that had actual silver in them. Yeah instead of this copper nickel counterfeit federal reserve bullshit. And if it was a bad report, I got, uh, she would take a toy away or I couldn't go outside and play. So I was encouraged to think, but I couldn't just shoot my mouth off. I had to prove what I had to say. 
And if you, you read a lot as a kid, do you remember a couple yeah. of those books that, you know, impacted your life? As a child? Yeah. I liked uh, fiction. Uh, that's what I read as a child, but I also read about the military. I loved airplanes. I memorized books on ships and airplanes. I loved Pippi Longstocking, <laughs> Pippi Longstrump. Yeah. <laughs> You're also sweet, so you understand yeah. Pippi. I do. I do. <laughs> yeah. So I also want to talk about, I, I did some research and you talked about a very impactful moment in your life when your father passed away and how that kind of changed your life. Would you mind sharing that with us? Sure. So my dad passed on in 2008. He was an amazing guy. He's, he was the part of the great generation, the greatest generation, the generation of Americans who went through the great depression and fought world war II. My father was a combat medic fighting the Nazis. He was wounded in battle, in the Battle of the Bulge. And as a medic, you're not allowed to carry a gun. So he had to go out there under fire, getting shelled, crawl through minefields, bring people back. And so my father was very ill. Towards the end of his life, his spine had basically crumbled from old age. He was in tremendous pain. So we were giving him more, well, I wasn't personally doing it, but the hospice nurse was giving him morphine drops under his tongue. And to not, he was knocked out completely. He didn't feel any pain. So my sister called me and said, hey, Paul, you better come down. Dad's limbs are getting cold. So I came down, and his breathing got shallower. The, most of the family was there. And just before he died, he opened his eyes, looked around. He had tremendous recuperative powers. He had three open-heart surgeries. was up in, in three weeks when you're supposed to be out for months. I like to think he channeled the last of his life force to open his eyes to say goodbye. But when my dad died, I saw something I didn't expect, and not a ghost or spirit. I saw the shell of my father. It was just his shell. And it really hit me. First of all, I never even conceptualized the idea of a shell of a human being. It was just his shell. He wasn't there. I thought, wow, one day I'm going to go that way. I'm just going to be an empty shell. I better play it big. And I better recognize that you only have a limited number of innings. And compared to everything else, that moment was really transformational really was. Then I remember I went and I ate ice cream. <laughs> I said, fucking, I'm out of here. I'm getting some ice cream. Thank you for sharing that. And, and, yeah. and I think there's, there's those pivotal moments in our life when we decide that we, we need to, you know, play all out, especially if you want to become, you know, successful at a high level. And Excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Uh, it's, it's time for an afternoon nap. My age, yeah, way past. <laughs> My girlfriend who's 19, I'm 62, she's 19, I, uh, kept me up late. I, I took a nap earlier before. Uh, so for people that are playing at a high level, but they, they need to take that extra step to play all out, to remove all their limiting beliefs. Is there Why? Any Why? Why do they want to do that? Why is that such a – what is wrong with playing at a high level? Why do we all need to be the best in the world? I want to question that premise. It used to be that people were happy with having a middle-class life, you know, a house and, and a family. Why do we all buy into this myth that we have to be peak performers at all times? Who sold us this shoddy bill of goods? Yeah. I'm serious. No, I, 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 I wanted to have a discussion about this. Yeah. Let's Who talk about sold it. us this shoddy bill of goods? We have to be the best in the world, 100%, all the time, 110%. This is the American myth and the, the American dream and the American torture. Where did we buy into this? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's very interesting because what I'm trying to do is to redefine the concept of success and what I've seen in my conversations with more than 200 guests that are high performance is that being the best is not always necessarily being the happiest. So that it's a very interesting question, but when I do something, I want to play at the best level because that's different than that. That's great. That's great. But we can't all be the best in the world. I can play some basketball, but I can never be a Michael Jordan or may he rest in peace of Kobe Bryant. Uh, LeBron James, 
I don't want to be, and I couldn't anyway. Well, let's talk about uh, let's let's debunk it. So there's what? something there's something I believe it's in the Talmud or the Midrash. Maybe it's in in the the, uh, the scripture that says, and I'm I'm an atheist, but it says, "Who is mighty? He who is content with his lot, and he who has conquered his own." desires is more powerful than he who has conquered a thousand cities why do i need a billion dollars why do i need 300 girlfriends let's question what really makes us happy what i found is yeah i buy into that too i'm stuck in that matrix but i also have a little little tiny bit of my personality that sees i'm happiest when i serve others and when I meditate and I have brief little moments, tiny little micro hits, micro, micro hits of being happy independent of circumstances, which I've only been able to find through meditation, but very, 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 very rarely, but it's still there. I know it's possible. It is. I mean, as a martial artist, we meditate a lot as well. And I am working on that every day to let go of, the attachment of having to be, you know, the best and instead being happy, which is, you know, might be what we're all looking for, right? I don't know. You're asking broad breaststroke yeah. rhetorical uh, questions. No, it's, it's not a question. It's that we're looking to be, to be happy. Do you agree with that? I am. You are. Some people are looking for control and power. That's what makes them happy. Yeah, overall, yes, of course. That's that's uh, uh, that's a non-starter. Of course, it's true. And I mean, I've met people that say, no, life is not about happiness. It's about serving people. And uh, some of the that's people- That's true, that but that's true. But you can be happy doing that. I don't think life ultimately is going to be satisfactory if it's about getting a bigger car or a hotter girlfriend or bigger muscles or tastier food. That's not what I think makes- human beings all for me it's having impact and purpose yeah. and knowing that i make a difference that's me yeah. other people hey banging chicks with big boobs may do it for you as long as i don't have to clean up after it pay for it and it doesn't keep me up at night i don't give a damn what people do for people that don't have an impact or purpose they might be stuck in that job right now where they're like they're making a lot of money they're you know always thinking about becoming the best so support a charity, support a charitable cause that you believe in. You said something that I want to move on to another subject before I let you go. I know you have a hard deadline a little bit. Uh, and I, I really like this. You said a person that doesn't need guarantee of success is attractive. And, and I really like that, you know, saying, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Human beings are looking for certainty. We want to know that something's going to work. We're hardwired to seek certainty, but we're also hardwired to seek novelty. So there's that constant friction in the human psyche to stay safe and have certainty and then have novelty and have new experience. And the way in which that arises uniquely for people, each person is different. How that arises tells you a lot about that person. It tells you a whole hell of a lot. So being able to move into something new and not need listen to me not need a guarantee that it's going to work doesn't mean you don't take appropriate cautions but not needing a guarantee and giving other people permission to have their first radical response to you they're giving them radical permission to have their first response to you is enormously attractive if i approach a woman i don't know and again i'm with an i have a hot girlfriend sorry ladies i'm taking neener 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 um, if I approach someone who I don't know and she responds in a way that's angry or, or nasty, I hold space for that. I don't judge her. I can interrupt that response if I don't judge her. I remember being out with a student who was striking out terribly. We went outside waiting for our cabs, tell you how long ago that was. And I said, look, there's a young lady waiting for a cab at the end of the evening. And she ripped into me. She told me to do things with my physiology that were just not anatomically possible. She brought up dead relatives. My student got very angry. He went to charge her. I put my arm out. I said, no, no. 
she can say whatever she wants. We decide who we, how we approach it. We decide where we come from. I said, look at her. I pointed at her. I said, she's someone's daughter. She's someone's sister. She's someone's best friend. Somewhere, she's deeply loved. Now, she went from rage to bursting into tears, sobbing, throwing her arms around me, kissing on me on the cheek and saying, I'm so sorry that almost you sh just showed me so much love. A guy's been pinching my ass all night long. What's your name? I said, Mr. Awesome. And off we go. <laughs> and But what did I do? I changed her response by holding space for her. I didn't know what was going to happen when I said that. So I wasn't sure, but I also gave her 100% permission, radical permission to have that first response of anger without firing back at her in an angry way and without sinking away and without apologizing. That enabled me, those two things, not needing a guarantee and giving her radical permission to have that anger response, enabled me to interrupt her pattern and come up with that language that shifted her. When you can combine those things, not needing a guarantee, giving people radical permission to have the first response and knowing how to use language, then you walk through the world with very, very stealthy power. It's magic at a stealth level. People will never be able to see you coming. You won't be super charismatic with lightning bolts coming out of your nipples and, and the rest of that shit, but you'll have a power that other people don't. And if you wanna learn more about that, and if you've got the money and want some coaching from me, just send me an email and I'll send you a link to apply to work with me again. I'm expensive. I'm worth every penny and I don't work with most people because you've got to have the right attitude. You've already got to be a winner and you've got to be willing to fork over a, a nice hefty investment to get me. So can I give out my email address? Yeah, sure. It's Paul at speakerpaulross.com. And if you want to write me and tell me to fuck off, that's great. I love hate mail. I reserve the right to screenshot it and put it on my Facebook wall, which I love doing. I love delicious hate mail. So please feel free, hate mail me. It will go on my Facebook wall and my girlfriend and I will get a good laugh out of it. And uh, again, if you want to work with me either on your sales or as a mentor to you for self-improvement, just write to me, Paul at Speaker Paul Ross, and I'll send you an application because no one talks to me unless I can review it and see that you at least are somewhere in the neighborhood of paying me. <laughs> awesome. So last Cause I, I do. The other thing is I do guarantee my work and I don't like giving money back. So that's one of the reasons why I'm very selective on who I work. With. Of course. I love that. And last question for you, and then I'm going to let you go. Yeah. I have a hard stop. coming up. Uh, so what is, for people that are listening and watching this, what's the first step for them to get a little bit closer to their dreams and goals? What's the first thing they can do right Align after? your, I'm funny, I'm working on a course called the Align Mind. I just outlined it yesterday. I bought this huge honking. I always design stuff first on paper and pen before I go to the computer. I bought this, you can see how big this fucker is. It's really big, yeah. It's huge sketchbook to uh, design it. I think you have to align your vision with your values. Yeah. You have to know what are your values? Because if you have a vision of having a huge home and lots of fast cars, but your values are contributing to the world and uh, giving away your money, you're not going to be happy. So align your vision with your values. Very, very important. And that is a three month process of coaching right there. Okay. Thank you so much, Paul Ross, AKA Ross Jeffries. I appreciate your time. Uh, you know, I had a great time with you today. I loved how you challenged me to think more and I hope- <laughs> That's my job, man. I, I, I just, when people ask questions, I demand that they clarify them. That's how I coach too. I kick ass when I coach. I like it, I love it. And for people that are listening here, I hope you got something out of this conversation. If you did, please share it with somebody that needs to hear this message and get a little bit close to their dreams. Check us out at ilovesuccess.co. You already have Paul's email. That's it for today. Thank you guys and all the best.